Gegroet bij recht met Robinson, hier op Lutnet en hartelijk welkom. Die voormalige leider van die dia, Tony Leon, heeft pas een boek geschreven, Future Tense, Reflections on My Troubled Land. Hij vertelt al meer wat achter die schermen gebeurd het met die interne woelingen in die hoge oppositiepartij, die verdeeldheid in die ANC en wat verwacht kan worden in die politiek voor de volgende jaar of twee. Hij deelt ook met ons zijn wedervaringen als ambassadeur in Argentinië, Paraguay en Uruguay. So welcome, Mr. Leon. It's nice seeing you and talking to you after quite a number of years. So it's good to see you. Welcome. Well, my thank you, Fred. The Oda van de SAUK. Jij was de groot man daar en ik was achterbank in de DAP, de destijds de DAP in Norida. Yeah. Okay. But it's a different kind of DA that we're dealing with today. today. And people are confused. They don't know really what they're going to vote for if they vote for the DA. Will it automatically mean that they're also going to vote for the ANC, for instance? What is your stand on that? Yeah, well, look, in this book, Freak, um, uh, two of the 16 chapters deal with the internal rulings of the DA, because I met Michiel Leroux and Ryan Kutsia was the leader of the committee that was done in the DA after the return of the van die verkiezing in 2019. En ik denk, uh, uh, die kern van die probleem op daar die stadium was die feit dat die DA was een zogenaamde ANC light. En die, uh, die kiezerkorps het niet geweet, zoals jij zei, waar, voor wat die DA zijn standpunt was. En hulle het baie, baie groot schade met hulle eie ondersteuners uh, ondergaan. Ik, uh, Een van die uh, hoofdstukken uh, hoofdstuk in mijn boek gaan oor die Schwaas Reineke debakel. En ek, dit was net uh, een voorbeeld van een groot proces waar die DA was bezig om een nieuwe kiesekorps te kry, maar uh, het nie uh, genoeg aandag uh, vir hulle heidige ondersteuners. En soos ons sê in Engels, they fell between two stools. And I think what the DA is now trying to do is to reposition itself. Of course, it's early days whether they can go back, get what they've lost and add to it uh, in the battle going forward. For new reposition support. to where? Reposition where? Ah. <laughs> You're going to have to ask the current leader that, not, not the, not the uh, retired one, which But I you am. must have views and you are probably concerned. I am concerned. Uh, let, let me say why I'm concerned, Freak. I'm concerned because it is fundamental for a, a, a fragile and often damaged democracy like us to have a strong opposition party. And, you know, by far, with all the problems, the DA is not just numerically, but I also think in terms of its philosophy, the strongest alternative to the ANC. So I, I think what the party is now trying to do is to see, well, can they actually put forward a proposition that people say, well, this is a party I can support. And obviously the jury's out because uh, you're only as good as your next election result. And, you know, I live in Cape Town and we, I have some arguments about how Cape Town's governed, but it's far and away better governed than any other city in South Africa. And that's because it's under the opposition. And also, if you take just any set of figures we have, and I, I deal with it at great length in this book, we have completely disabled municipalities. In fact, if it weren't for Solidaritate or Afri Forum, we probably wouldn't have municipal services in many of the rural areas where the civil society groups like that provide it. But all the municipalities with clean audits are controlled by the DA or by opposition coalitions. And in the free state, 61% of municipalities uh, are either bankrupt or corrupted or misgoverned, according to the Auditor General and they're under the ANC's control. So I think the tell board say for us that there is a better alternative alternative under the DR Fondle. But they must have to be able to bring the Kiesekorps in and create an understanding basis that says, yeah, this is the South sort of Africa where I want to live or where I want to live. But the tell board, as you say, is very clear dat um, die DA het omtrent 500.000 stemmen verloor. Uh, meeste van die Afrikaners en die witmense van hierdie land gesê, wel, ons wil nie meer vir die DA stem nie en dat is oor naar die vrijheid van plus toe. Denk jy dat het is nodig om te herpositioneer, die DA, 
so dat daar die, die kiesers weer teruggewend kan word. Ole, moet vir jy sê, wanneer ek die leier van die DRP en daarna die dia was, was dit een van die uh, groot uh, uh, take van, uh, onder my leiderskap om seker te maak dat mense as Af Afrikaans, speer, sprekende Suid-Afrikaners, uh, thuis voel in een paar thuis soos die DA. En ons was baie succesvol met daar die project, want ek dink die uh, kiesers van in daar die hoek van die kiesekorps het geweet dat die DA is die soort partij wat die belange van die gemeenskap kan na die parlement en na die in die provinciale wetgevers en die uh, plaaslike regerings uh, hulle, hulle kan vertrouw word met die belange van die gemeenskap. En die DA het daar die, uh, daar die vertrouw verloor. Dus hoe kom hulle 500.000 uh, kiesers uh, in die uh, 2019 uh, uh, verkiesing verloor het. Ek moet vir jou ook sê, dat uh, daar die, uh, die kiesers, of die meerderheid van minderheid kiesers, nog uh, by die DA bly. Maar, jy kan nie verseker, dat die kiesers sal altyd op jou kant wees. En ek denk die DA is besig, om daar die kiesers te behou, of te, te weet, uh, in, in, onder die partijwandel te bring. Ons sien hulle is baie besig, uh, met initiatieven soos hier die uh, klug oor Lindsay Dentlinge, oor Stellenbos taalbeleid. Ek, ek denk hulle is besig om die uh, kiesers uh, vertrouwe weer te kry. Maar jy kan nie net een minderheidspartij word. As jy net sê ek wil die minderheide, minderhede in hierdie land ondersteun, is jy uh, onder die 10% of 15% kantlijn. En die DA het meer as 15%. Maar ja, jylle het, jy het zwart steen nodig, ne? Jylle het zwart steen nodig. Ja. But uh, unfortunately, all the, your experiments so far uh, failed. Um, after your reign, of course, not during your reign. But um, there were so many other people, you know, Mampele Rampeli, Ndiwe Mazibuko, uh, yeah. Patricia De Lille, Musi Maimani, Herman uh, Chabadara, Herman Mashal. Oh. Uh, trying to get the black vote, but in the end, you only managed at most almost 6%, and that's it. So, yeah, well, yeah, I, I think that's right, Greg. I, I mean, I do make the point in my book when I was uh, head of the DA in the 2000 elections, when we first formed the DA, just a few months afterwards, we got about 5% of the black vote. And then, all those years later, with my money at the helm and millions of rand spent, they advanced by 1% in that electorate. So, it's, it's they are slim pickings. You're quite right about that. What I do concentrate on the book when I look at the DA is to say, Freak, that um, what they were doing with all these quick fixes from, you know, Lindiwe Mazabuko to uh, Patricia Diddle was to what I call short circuit history. So there was a kind of trying to fuse things together without actually doing the background. I think the thing that gives me hope, however long, difficult and often unrewarding this journey is, is that I, I quote in this book, apart from a lot of the personal stories and the inside intrigues, which of course, give color to a book like this, I do quote what actual ordinary voters think, black voters. And the majority of voters in this country, black, white, Indian, colored, green, whatever, actually want things other than race. They're not interested in land expropriation. They're not interested in uh, this sort of the rust tambour, Levitamakni. They are interested in education, jobs, opportunities and safety. And I think, you know, it sometimes takes a long time, but the DA and other parties like the DA and whatever parties come after it, need to concentrate on the interests of the voters and to make themselves credible in pursuit of those interests. And then I think you will start to see change. Look, the other thing, if I can just mention at the end of the book, when I look at the future of South Africa, I do look quite carefully and with some detail at what you might call natural parties of government. There's no such thing. I mean, the so-called liberation parties, India, Israel, Mexico, some of them last for a long time, but eventually they get voted out of office. And that is the moment, whenever it happens, that any opposition party has got to prepare itself and anticipate. What I can't give you for that is the date. But you know, I grew up when I first got interested in politics, and the National Party was all dominant. There was no prospect. I was involved in the progressives and, and you know, the opposition. And, and there was no 
idea that the opposition could ever become the government. And then, boom, 1994, the National Party goes from this mighty uh, governing party to a 20% party. In the next election, it's reduced to a 7% party election. After that, it's disappeared entirely. So once your negatives and, and events start conspiring, they move very rapidly. And, and you know, that, that's the one thing that gives me hope. This book has got a lot of negatives because the country condition is poor. I call it future tense. It's a troubled land, as I say in my title. But the fact that events move much quicker often than governments anticipate is actually, to me, a cause of hope, not hopelessness for our situation and for the opposition over time. But uh, the DA will be going into this election later this year, if it's going to be this year, uh, and it will have a white male middle-aged person in charge. Now, is that the right strategy? Well, they tried a younger black uh, leader, and that proved to be the wrong strategy. Look, I, you know, if if uh, I, I make the point in my book, I mean, I do say, I'm, I've, I've told him to his face, so I'm not telling him anything he doesn't know. I said to Stian Hazen, you were born with a birth defect. You know, you're a white male in a country where gender and race are seen as absolute. That's the determinant of your life, of your political chances. So I guess it's, you know, whether people uh, decide over time at the next election, that's the most important thing. Once again, there's a disconnect between <clears throat> how people vote for parties and what they actually think on the issues. You know, one of the facts that I uh, put in my book and this was, uh, I'd, you know, the, the figures came out of a report article about two years ago, is at the height, well, the, we've never got a, a good moment for electricity supply in this country. ESCOM was busy purging 1,700 white engineers from its books because they didn't fit the racial profile. Now, I can go into any township, I can go into any hooky van hierdie land in Seferdi Mensa for Swart or Brain Mensa say, well, yeah, it's a kiss no. Will you die lichte kry, or will you lichte hee, or will you uh, die wit uh, mense eight uh, FCOM uh, scores? And I promise you that 99.2% of anyone you speak to is going to say, we want the lights on, and we don't care who puts the lights on, we want uh, lighting. We don't care about other things. And the only thing, the only policy left with the ANC having pretty much you know, put this country flat on its back economically and socially is the question of race. And um, I, I think you've got to hold fast against that. And whether the DA is a white leader or a black leader or a brown leader, it's either going to make its case or it's not. But I don't think the racial identity of the leader is going to be the absolute determination. Of course, in South Africa, it is a, it's a very potent factor. And, you know, when I was leader of the DP a long time ago, I said, the problem with my party is it looked like a combination of the Rand Club and Indy Bruderbund. It was sort of, you know, very white. And then the, 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 the DA today is much less white. And that's appropriate because we live in an overwhelmingly non-white country. But if you choose your top leader simply on the basis that he or she has a particular skin color rather than whatever else they've got to offer, then you simply are being the ANC in a different form, because that's all they know to do. And that has led this country into a very dark place. But you, must, of... you have done some analysis of the ANC and what is going to happen within the party over the next year or so. Uh, apart from the internal strife that there is in that party, there is also, it seems to be factions, one more left and the other one more to the right. And, um, the ANC in general wants to move forward in the National Democratic Revolution, have state control over anything. Is that more or less your assessment of what we're going to see from the ANC going into the next election? Yes, I think that, you know, along with racial uh, percentages is the only policy that they know. In fact, if, if I can just, you know, quote something that I actually say in the book, I said, uh, the more the... Uh, the more that was demanded of the state, the more the ANC, through a set of other policies, had incapacitated the state. So you have this extraordinary situation where you're pulling in two completely different directions. On the one hand, you're saying we want more state control. And on the other hand, whether it's in 700 state-owned companies 
whether it's in the post office, which doesn't deliver letters, ESCOM, which can't keep the lights on. The ANC has actually, through a set of policies, disabled the state from performing its core functions, yet it loads up the state with more and more uh, responsibilities. And, and one of the things that I look at, you know, obviously, because I wrote this book during the coronavirus uh, pandemic last year, and it's up to date as far as one can be to January of this year, is this incredible idea that somehow we were going to introduce a national health initiative. Now, you, ne you need to understand our dear President Cyril Ramaphosa said, it, this NHI is coming to you whether you like it or not. Now, the problem with that is according to Alex van Kieren, Kieren at the Wits University, who's an expert on health matters, he said it's going to cost about 31% of our GDP to implement a health service, a health scheme that has never been attempted in any country of South Africa besides anywhere in the world. And you'd think, now, hang on, what have we seen about the public health service? It didn't have ventilators in sufficient quantity, didn't have enough oxygen. People were fighting in Port Elizabeth hospitals of scarce supplies and getting into hospital. And the vaccine rollout, which we're still waiting for if you're not a nurse or a doctor in this country, has been a debacle because uh, for six months last year, the health department did nothing to procure vaccines. So you're going to say, well, hang on, they failed in all these core tasks, but actually they now want to take away the private health service, which actually works in this country, and push it into the public health service. And so, you know, these, these contradictions eventually will out. And that is why but the ANC doesn't know how to uh, stop doing what it's doing. You know, it, it does remind me, and I'm perhaps old enough and ugly enough for it, to remember, at the very height of apartheid, let's say when I was a, a, a you know, boy at school in the 1970s, and quite overwhelmingly, it was apparent that the South African economy required more and more workers who happened to be black, because that's where the majority were, to actually work in factories in the cities. You had people like uh, Connie Mulder and others saying, by 1978, most blacks will not be in the urban areas we will have them in, in the homelands. It was, it was completely in defiance of economic logic. I'm not talking about the human cost of that. I'm talking about the economics. And yet they persisted with those policies until the policies failed and the, lot, and the, the economics of the situation demanded that there be a change, which was one of the factors why South Africa did uh, experience the dramatic change it has done in the last few years. So I think those same forces with different uh, applicability today will also undermine whatever the grand plans of the ANC are. Well, let's talk about the economy then. We all know that the economy is in dire straits uh, at the moment. Uh, and perhaps you can share with us your experiences in, in Uruguay and in South America uh, about debt and what is going to happen, uh, what happened there and what, what, what might happen to us. Yes. You know, it's funny, I, I, do, I do recount in the book uh, my, my last conversation with Jacob Zuma, who was residence, not in Canada, but the one in Pretoria. Um, in, when I came back from Argentina and he asked me what it's like, I said, well, Mr. President, it's uh, worse governed and more corrupt than South Africa. But that, of course, was 2012 and 2021. Uh, it's probably the reverse of that, that South Africa is probably today worse governed and more corrupt than Argentina, which is quite an achievement. What Argentina, and you know, I lived there for three years, I was very absorbed in the whole of society, I was very close to government, I was doing my job promoting South Africa there. Argentina has continuously tried to defy the laws of economic logic. And, and one of the results of that, it's actually economically historically, maybe not today, been in a worse situation in South Africa, is that it keeps borrowing more money, especially from the IMF, and then defaulting on its loans, whether from private uh, investors or bondholders, or from international agencies like the IMF. As you know, the ANC has uh, got a bit of a neuralgia about uh, going to the IMF, but we've really got a soft loan from them. And if R.W. Johnson and others are correct, then we're going to have to land up at the IMF for a big loan with a lot of conditions, which is what Argentina did. It promised to make reforms. It didn't make the reforms. It defaulted and then got further and further away from kind of the international credit market. The what, other was thing the that, what was the practical uh, experience of people under those conditions? 
Yeah, the, the experience is very dire. I mean, I mean, the first thing that happens is a run on the currency. Now, you know, we've just seen the newspaper this morning that although the rand has actually done quite well, it's suddenly starting to reverse. But I mean, in Argentina, it reverses at a huge rate. And so local folk don't trust the currency. I mean, basically, they everything there is done in dollars. But dollars are very hard to get because the government tries to restrict the flow. So there's a already a black market in currency, just like we had a black market in booze and cigarettes last year, they have one in currency. Now, South Africa, because it's actually the one thing in this country, and I do make, that we have is an independent reserve bank. They don't print money, which they do in Argentina, and they actually allow our rand, our currency, to float according to its, its value in markets. But here's the Argentinian warning coming you know, to a, a cinnamon for you soon. You have people like Ace Makashula saying, no, no, we must actually have what he calls quantity easing. He means quantitative easing, printing money. And he is the same person and that faction, that radical economic transformation faction are the same folk who actually don't want the Reserve Bank to be independent and stand uh, as a bastion against cheap money policies. So in Argentina, there was no independence of institutions. It got so bad when I was there, Priya, that when independent economists reported the true rate of inflation, which was going through the roof because of the uh, economic mismanagement, they were prosecuted criminally. So it would be like someone like Magnus Heistek here giving warnings about the economy or Mike Schussler, and then the government saying, no, no, you can't say that, you can't use those figures, we're going to take criminal action against you. That's, that's how Argentina flattened institutions. And the result is that people just stop taking it seriously. But the thing that Argentina does, which we don't do, is they produce food. And uh, Bill Clinton, who was uh, met when he was on a speaking tour there, said, we don't know what the future of the world is, but everyone's going to have to eat. And Argentine soya beans are used, uh, provide 40% of the protein for animals in China, which is their biggest export market. We aren't so fortunate. I mean, what we think is so exceptional in South Africa, we've got gold and we've hugely diminished the class. We do have platinum, but economic life forms are changing in South Africa, Priya. You know, it's going to be electric motor cars, not uh, cars that use catalytic converters in the future. It's going to be data is going to be the new thing, not so much stuff you dig out of the ground. So what I'm saying is, although Argentina is a poster boy of not what to do, it still has an economic uh, vitality because of the food that it produces for the world. And we don't have that advantage here. We do very good on agricultural exports, but you know, we, our mineral uh, treasure house is not what we thought it was. You deal a little bit in your book uh, about uh, the love affair between the ANC and Venezuela uh, and other similar states and so on. But let me bring it back to South Africa then and the president himself. Are you personally disappointed in the president and do you believe that he's in his heart a socialist or not? Well, I think he's a chameleon. I don't know any of us know what he actually is in his heart because uh, I think he's, you know, he he's, doesn't steal money unlike his predecessor. He's economically literate unlike Zuma. You know, compared to Zuma, he's much better. But, you know, does he really stand for anything? I mean, you know, I was involved very deeply and uh, with him and a lot of other significant people like Rolf Mayer and uh, Joe Slovo and uh, F.W. de Klerk, all of whom feature in this book, in the fashioning of our constitution. This was uh, Ramaphosa's shining moment. And yet, as I indicate in the book, Friuk, at key moments in, since he's become president, not while he was not president, he has undermined the constitution, whether it's to do away with the property clause or make it pretty meaningless as a protective instrument, which he promised it would be in 1996, uh, whether it's to actually take away the court's jurisdiction when it comes to adjudicating disputes related to land. Rampos has been very equivocating. He's been, you know, uh, he's been speaking out of both sides of his mouth. So I, I don't know if the Sura Ramaphosa that I knew or, we, or thought I knew in 1990 or 1996 is the same Sura who governed South Africa in 2021. And we do know from him, and, and here I think there's something quite interesting in South African history. 
We do know from him because he said it last year that he would rather be perceived as a weak president who doesn't take these tough decisions which are articulated in the book and elsewhere than the person who presides over the disunity of the ANC. Now, I need to say that um, John Forster, if you go back in time, 12 years prime minister of South Africa, did not have a, a great track record. In fact, did no reformers that, we, that are worth speaking about, simply doubled down on Fabudian apartheid. His great concern was to maintain the unity of the National Party. Now, his successor, Pierre V. Buerta, who also doesn't have a great press, although he's strange enough, as I point out in the book, more admired by the ANC than F. V. de Klerkers, which is another story I look at there. Pierre V. Buerta knew that even his reform agenda, which was limited, but quite dramatic in some ways, could only happen if there was a split in the National Party, that he got rid of the Verkrumpters under Dr. Trenicht and others, and he basically engineered their departure from the party into the Conservative Party. And then the reform process started, it wasn't completed, and Effia completed that process. But he knew that you couldn't have both. You couldn't have the unity of the National Party and political reform. And equally today, although it's very different South Africa, different situation, you cannot have the economic reforms that are necessary to salvage our situation, get people into work, create investor confidence, and maintain the unity of the ANC. So in a way, and these are not exact rep figures, I mean, Ramaphosa has got to decide what, he, what he's going to do. And if he sticks to his decision last year, it's the unity of the ANC at all costs. That's my priority, not reforming the economy, not bringing the change that are needed then I'm afraid the future is very bleak and it will be bleak under his watch. What he has done so far specifically is to try to bring investors to South Africa uh, and to actually get them to put down uh, hundreds of millions of dollars and so on and so on. But do you believe that the conditions are created for those investors to come forward and to have the, the, the courage to say, let me put money in South Africa? Well, obviously, some do, and, and there are some encouraging signs, particularly in the you know, motor world of you know, motor manufacturing and so on. So I don't want to dismiss it all. But, you know, as we, we were talking earlier from the Telbot, the Telbot said, there is a vermindering of the land that in South Africa come. It's actually dramatically declined. We're getting less and less of the investment pie compared to other developing countries. And obviously, the world has changed because of COVID economics, because there's been a, a global recession, if not depression, in the last year. But the economies of the world are starting to recover. And uh, but you know you, you you've got to keep making this attractive. Now you know I mentioned uh, taking away people's property rights, which includes all property rights, or diminishing them is not a way to get investment. It's a fundamental. But more materially, I mean you know uh, the, the opening chapter of this book details. Uh, my uh, experience with Sir Ramaphosa in New York when he was uh, speaking at a hotel that uh, gathering that I attended. And he said, the reforms are going to start, and this is, bear in mind, for September 2018, fast and furious. We haven't been fast enough, they're gonna come fast and furious. Well, here we are nearly two and a half years later, and all the reforms that were spoken around 2018, which would help with investment, the auctioning of the spectrum, the uh, breaking up of ESCOM, the uh, privatization of, of ports in South Africa. These were promised three years ago. Um, uh, the energy, independent energy procurement, haven't actually happened two and a half years after he said that happened fast and furious. And, you know, people actually, you know, we've got, there's a wonderful word in Afrikaans, you know, people judge you not by your words, but by the credibility of your actions. And I understand uh, when I was on another thing last night, Peter Dutoy of News 24 said, yeah, but aren't you being a bit harsh on Cyril because he's got all these dynamics to deal with. He's uh, only got 51% of the votes of Nasrec. He's got internal divisions. Of course, I understand. But leaders have got to lead. They can't just sit in the middle and say, yeah, well, I've got to balance factions. That's not leadership. That's management. And then coming to the Zondo Commission, um, Two things, perhaps. Um, the first one is, is it true that there seems to be some kind of um, a lack of trust in the rule of law? And um, 
the constitution being pushed a little bit aside. Do you see that kind of trend, trend happening? I, I certainly do. I, I think it's, an, it's, it's not a complete picture once again, Priyak. I think there are instances where the rule of law does work in South Africa, but you know, it, it is very troubling. I mean, what happened in the last few weeks is just extraordinary. And I'm not talking about this disastrous situation in the Western Cape where the judge president, Mr. John Schlope, who still remains in office, or even the public protector who still remains in office. I'm talking about the fact it wasn't just an allegation, but it was serious evidence was led by a former ANC cabinet minister, Sidney Mufamadi, and then corroborated by the acting uh, director general of intelligence, Mr. Jafta, that millions of round of state money was taken and delivered on their version strong circumstantial evidence, they said, to a judge or judges in order to bribe them so they wouldn't give adverse rulings against Jacob Zuma. Now, you know, I'm a detribalized lawyer, Frick, and I've, you know, been involved on the both inside law and watching it from the outside as a trained lawyer. And I have never heard such an allegation ever made in South Africa in my 64 years, that judges were bribed with state money to favor an outcome uh, ruling for the president. But yet, Sir Ramposa again had that report from Mufamadi two years ago. He sat on it. He didn't take action to investigate whether it was true or not. Zondo was given the, the evidence just in the last month. And we're now waiting that, you know, at some point after going through millions of pages of evidence, uh, Zondo, Judge Zondo, will, Justice Zondo, will make some determination along with 25,000 other things he's got to decide. I would say that is so serious, that allegation. Never mind the Chief Justice's views on Israel, which I see has been very quickly disciplined for, but that is so fundamentally undermines the rule of law in a real and destructive way that it requires a separate urgent investigation right now to restore people's faith. Because if you appear in a court of law, whether you're a you know, young burgo or Groot Maatskape, and you think that the judge you're appearing before might have taken a bribe or be susceptible to bribery, you can have no confidence in the rule of law. It's absolutely fundamental, that is. Judge Zondo also said that it seems that there's a derelict of duty from M of, of parliamentarians who do not do the oversight function that they should be doing. Do you agree? I completely agree. Look, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, people, they look at the Springbok rugby team if you're of a certain age. Oh, you know, 20 years ago when I was a young man, it was a great team. Now it's not so great. You know, you can, you can distort things by looking at the present through the lens of the past. So I don't want to say Parliament was fantastic when I was there. It's gone. It's all gone, uh, gone, gone haywire since I left. That's not the point. But there is a serious accountability deficit from the very people who should be uh, doing parliament, uh, doing the oversight. And, and, and one of the ladies, one of the ANC committee chairman, chair ladies, chairperson, sorry, who gave evidence to Zondo just a few weeks ago, you'll recall, basically said, well, we couldn't investigate corruption because I'm there to carry out the ANC's mandate. I take instructions from the ANC, not from the voters, not from parliament's institution. I take it from the ANC. And, and you don't need to pay 400 MPs 1.1 million rand each a year, spent half a billion rand just paying our national legislators, um, in order for them to just be ciphers for the ruling party or any other party. They've got to exercise oversight. They've got to do their job. But, you know, it starts at the top. I mean, one of the figures I give here is uh, one year in Parliament, uh, we always look at the EFF disrupting Parliament. It was the national executive of the government. I mean, they only answered... 17% of the questions that were put to them on the order paper. And I might say there was a lot wrong with the parliament I first joined, the Suchenamde Driekamer Stelsel Parliament, and the most biggest problem was it didn't represent the majority of South Africans. But as an institution, it took itself more seriously. So there was no way that a cabinet minister, when we had question time on a Tuesday, would arrive, would not arrive, and if he did arrive, he had to answer the questions on the order paper. There was, it was absolutely uh, went that happened. And that's because the institution, however limited it was, took itself seriously. 
And until you restore the seriousness of parliament, put serious minded people into it, and the ruling party is not allowed just to turn the parliament into an extension of itself, you're going to uh, sit with this problem. Now, we have spoken about this a little bit earlier, but anyway, here in your book, Future Tense, Reflections on My Troubled Land. It indicates uh, some kind of a pessimistic outlook uh, for the future. Are you absolutely sure that uh, we're heading for calamity? No, I'm not sure. And anyone who tells you that they're sure is, uh, is, is misleading you. And I, look, I said the, and I, I end the book by saying that uh, there is every reason to fear for the future of South Africa. But the hope of a better country remains an improbable but not an impossible dream. And, and I do sketch out in the last chapter, the nine signposts on the road to the future, that some of them are very negative. And if you're honest with yourself, and I, you know, you've got to, there's no point in going through the agonies of writing a book if you're just going to have, you know, Sonskane uh, and Ruissa, does need to do it me. You must be honest with yourself and then with your readers. And I've tried to be brutally honest with myself and with the readers by interrogating. So there's some very big negative warning, red lights, orange lights. There are also some... Biggest, big, the biggest one? Well, you the biggest one is the, is, is, is the financial situation, that we are just going to be overwhelmed by debt, that the government is so resistant to introducing reforms that will grow the economy, get people to work, that the only thing they can do is to keep borrowing money. But at some point, the costs of borrowing are so extreme, they overwhelm everything else, and you can't do anything else. And what is interesting to me, you know, because obviously we had to edit this book about three times now, you know, lost 25,000 words on the cutting room floor, because I had a very strict editor. When I started writing this book at the end of 2019, we were, the costs of borrowing to pay the debt, which was public service wages and uh, social grants, was about a billion rand a day per working day. That's what it cost just to, the, the borrowing cost. When I started getting towards the end of this book at the end of last year, which was just about 14 months later, the borrowing costs or the debt service costs had doubled to 2 billion rand a day. So that's not sustainable. And when you reach a point, you're in a debt trap where the cost of borrowing just overwhelms everything else. And you actually can't pay back the principal or even the borrowing costs and there's no money left to do anything else. So I, I think that is the biggest single danger and the most, positive? the most positive thing is what I call a thousand points of light, which is that if you look at everything through the lens of the state, if you look at things outside of the state, there's some fantastic things happening. I, I look at the work of Afri Forum, for example, in helping municipalities. I look at the Muslim organization, Gift of the Givers. I look at the Jewish organization, Africa Tikkun. These groups do amazing work helping people other than just their own uh, members in the wider community. And, you know, I, I, I go right back to the bleakest moment in, 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 in the dawn of the new South Africa, which is, you recall very well, you were right on the front line, um, the, uh, the assassination on Easter Saturday 1993 of Chris Harney by two white right-wing killers. And, and I draw, I just remind people of how Nelson Mandela diffused the situation by reminding people there was an Afrikaans housewife in Boxburg called Margarita Haramsa, who actually identified who the killers were and helped stave off a whole racial apocalypse here. Now, there are plenty of Margarita Haramsas in South Africa today, not in staving off a racial civil war, but in doing extraordinary acts of everyday kindness and decency, which help people, which help repair the gap in our society. And we have companies in this country that despite all the obstacles, despite all the unfriendliness from the state, do amazing things. I was thinking of Naspers, you know, it's huge, biggest, uh, it, it's one of the biggest operators in the internet in China. I was thinking of Nando's, you can't go anywhere in the world, or when we could travel the world, we won't see an outlet of Nando's, South African, you know, Portuguese recipe chicken. And, you know, Bidvest, and uh, you look at, uh, of course, Steinhoff is the, is the counter example, which looked quite, quite encouraging for a while and then turned on to, uh, you know, I use the example of Johan Rupert. I mean, most family owned companies, obviously a big public company, Richemont, but it started as a family entity. Most family heirs or family companies take a large fortune turned to a smaller fortune. 
Johann Rupert, who gets no thanks from his government, except when he gave him a billion rand last year, they did step up and actually say thank you, um, you know, took his father's big empire and turned into a huge empire in the world. And, and the many, many Michiel Leroux, who I had the distinction of serving on that panel with, you know, uh, is, is, is ex the, the work he did with Capitec is remarkable. I can take public education, which has been a disaster, and I deal with the disaster in my book. And then you look at um, you look at how affordable private schooling has been made available to more and more South Africans. You know, it was one guy who started what has become a huge company, uh, which he started in a Gemeente in the northern suburbs of Cape Town with one school. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of schools under that brand. And they all do work which helps South Africa and South Africans. And if they could only be allowed to carry on doing that, you'd live in a different country. Daniel Leon, thank you very much. Good luck and go well. Bye, thank you, Meneer. Ik waardeer het. Tot ziens. Tot ziens.